Welcome to the Hawke's Bay App Napier Candidates Debate. Thanks to the Urban Winery in Napier for hosting us and for Engage Video for producing and broadcasting this debate. Thanks to the candidates as well. Joining me are um, Mark Hutchinson of Labour, Martin Langford of Democracy NZ, Julian Dickey of the Green Party, Laurie Turnbull of New Zealand First, Katie Nimmin of National Party, and Pavel Molesky of ACT Party. Thank you, everyone. So, thank you, Andrew. Um, to the candidates, as I said, thank you for joining me. We look forward to a good <coughs> debate. Uh, just a reminder that um, you can interject. We're going to have an actual debate. Uh, we'll start off with um, two minutes from uh, everyone, just an opening address. So we'll start with you, Mark. Thanks, Andrew. I I'm Mark Hutchinson. I'm from Napier. Um, I grew up in Teradale uh, and then have chosen to raise my kids here and built a successful business here from scratch. Um, the reason that I'm standing at this election cause I, is, is because I think there's two, two kind of key issues that we're leaning into. And one of those is inequality and the other is climate change. And for the sake of our kids, we need to tackle those two things together. So I'm, I'm standing for Napier because I think I'm the, the candidate that has the experience to advocate really strongly for Napier. Um, my background is that you know, after school in Taradale, I trained in Otago as a clinical psychologist. I spent the first 10 years of my career working with children and families, so I understand uh, deeply the issues that matter to families and how that, uh, what kids need to get ahead and reach their potential. And I've spent the last 20 years, both in the UK and here in New Zealand, working with senior leaders and large organisations across the public and private <coughs> sector to lean into difficult challenges and get things done. So since I've been back in Napier in 2000, and I came back in 2009 to raise our kids. Um, I've set up my own successful business and I consult to large organisations that you might be familiar with, organisations like Fletcher, Fonterra, uh, the energy companies, um, you know, the New Zealand Transport Agency and New Zealand Post to help CEOs and their leadership teams lead effectively. So I think that I bring um, a broad range of experience that means that I can be a really successful uh, advocate for Napier. I've already done some of that. Um, and the reason that I'm standing for Labour is because that Labour has always stood <coughs> for building a strong economy that delivers opportunity for everybody. And I think that um, at the moment we face a really big choice and the choice is between continuing progress so that that's difficult and not always perfect and um, going backwards back onto a track towards policies that have been proven to fail in the past. Okay, are you finished? Yep. Martin? <laughs> Thank you. I know we're limited to two minutes, so I'll be, I'll be reading. I'm Martin Langford. I'm the Democracy New Zealand uh, candidate for the Napier electorate, and I've lived in Napier for the past 26 <coughs> years, working as a dental surgeon and still working today. I'll be back to the orifice after this. <laughs> My wife and I have raised our two children here to be independent adults. I was educated in the UK, and I have experience of the NHS Health Service, and I was a dental officer in the Royal Air Force for five years before emigrating to New Zealand in 1996. I have been on the board of the Princess Alexandra Trust for 15 years, and I have seen the plight of those the health system has failed. As a healthcare professional, I can identify where positive change can and needs to be implemented to make immediate improvements in our health service. As a small business owner, with over two decades of experience, I understand the issues affecting 90% of the businesses in the Napier electorate and can see how poor government decisions can cause significant problems. I have been an active participant in the Napier <coughs> community, being involved with a mixture of volunteer groups over the years. The events of the last three have convinced me I need to leave the comfort zone of my practice to stand for what I believe in and represent the Napier electorate in Parliament and make positive change from within. Matt King, the Democracy New Zealand Party leader, has the drive, determination and indeed the policies to implement positive change and that is why I am standing as a Democracy New Zealand candidate. In the aftermath of Cyclone Gabrielle, it, was, it became apparent that there is a disconnect between central and local government and certainly between government and the people of Hawke's Bay. I want to be active in Parliament, promoting and cham championing the people of the Napier electorate, rectifying the current situation and ready to stand up and be proactive when needed in the future. We may be a young and small party, but we need to be a major, we may intend to be a major influence on the government. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Julian? Uh, kia ora. I'm Julianne. I'm the Julianne Dickey. I'm the Green Party candidate for Napier. I'm actually parting, uh, asking for the party vote rather than the electoral vote um, because 
what I believe we need is a really strong caucus of Green MPs in Parliament. Um, and for two reasons. I joined the Green Party for two reasons. Um, because, first of all, I, we need absolutely to do something about climate change and about the environment, and secondly, uh, to do something about fairness. Just to say a little bit about me, uh, I grew up in Auckland. Um, I left when I was 26, uh, I went to the UK. Most of my career there was in the uh, disability and mental health fields where I was a senior manager. Um, I then became a management consultant, uh, working with over 100 companies, both private sector, uh, third sector and public sector. Um, and in that time, I learned that it's really, really important um, for an organisation and a government to have vision to achieve what they can for everyone, for all their staff and in terms of a government for all their people. Um, so I came back to New Zealand in 2014 um, and I joined the Green Party. And as I said, I'm passionate about uh, doing something to both um, prevent climate change from getting worse and also to mitigate the effects of climate change when the extreme weather events like we've seen in Cyclone Gabriel actually happen. And secondly, I'm also passionate about a New Zealand where everyone um, has a warm, safe, affordable home and can have the resources that they need um, to <coughs> live a good life. Thank you so much. Laurie. Hi guys, yeah, I will read a little bit later because I'm like Martin, I sort of can't remember everything I need to say. Um, I'm originally um, from Wairau, grew up there, got married in Wairau, um, worked with the telecom, as a telecom linesman, moved to uh, Papua New Guinea in 1988 after Cyclone Bowler, uh, spent time there, um, seven years with the communication company, and then moved to Sharjah, which is an emirate in the United Arab Emirates, spent time there and started off as a, a telecom engineer but worked up, did an extramural um, postgraduate degree through Massey in business management. So we ended up getting some senior jobs and I think one of the biggest jobs I had overseas was as a director of human resource and organisation development for Dubai Internet City. Um, spent a bit more time, did two years in Saudi Arabia and in HR consulting and then moved my family, second family, back to New Zealand in 2014. And then did a last stint in Papua New Guinea as um, an HR consultant with Octeti Mining, doing all their HR systems. So what I reckon, um, I'll read this out. A part of our mandate is to look at different aspects of bringing New Zealand back to where we used to be. Things like, if you want to defend democracy and freedom, then let's fight separatism, and each of us matters, so we need to fight this agenda. If you want to be able to tackle the cost of living, then we've got to take on the foreign-owned banks and the supermarkets, charging more here than they do in their own, own countries. If you want to create an opportunity for all, then let's level up health, seconds. employment, education, and infrastructure. If you want to be tough on crime, then let's tackle the gangs and prioritise community safety. If you want to improve the lives of our seniors, which I am one of, then let's ensure we look after them. We all deserve it. I guess for me it's just about Time. getting New Zealand back to where we were before 2020. Thank you. Katie Nimmin. Well, I'm Katie Nimmin. I'm the National Party candidate for Napier. Uh, and I always start by saying that Napier is more than just the city around us. The electorate goes all the way up to Matawai, uh, includes Wairoa, includes Tinaroto, uh, includes Murawai, uh, Patoka as well. And all of these areas have got very broad issues. Uh, and I consider myself a really connect a connected and committed representative. My background is uh, primarily in transport and tourism. I actually went and worked in advertising for the first couple of years of my career. Uh, which was a great experience, um, but I was always jokingly called the ambassador for Hawke's Bay because when I lived in Auckland, I never stopped talking about the region. Uh, and of course, I came back and got heavily involved in tourism and trying to build our, our industry here uh, and growing what it is that we offer. Um, and inevitably, within a couple of years, I'd won an award for uh, the, being the brand ambassador or the ambassador for Hawke's Bay Tourism. Um, and so look, I've, I've always been committed to this region first, uh, and the region become, it comes before business. I've done a master's in business, uh, and I've worked in, in transport and across multiple committees. 
I've also been on the advisory committee for the School of Hospitality and Tourism at EIT uh, before it became Te Pukinga, and I think that local advice and, and guidance has been really powerful, um, and it's a real shame to see that taken away. Look, my, my career has been dedicated to service uh, and representing the National Party, being connected to the community across the board, all over the region, is really important to me. Uh, you know, I need to make sure that I'm available to listen to people because it's not my views that I should be putting on top of people's views. You're representing the electorate, you're representing the people, and uh, that's a really important job for me. Um, and so, of course, you know, service has, has been my entire career, and I think that's really important to put across. The National seconds. Party is a party that is going to get New Zealand back on track. We are the party of delivering on outcomes. We are the party that is going to reduce the cost of living. And so it's really important that I stand in front of everybody and share the values that National have that genuinely make a difference in people's lives. Because New Zealand Fine. has a lot to get back on track. Thank you. Thank you. Pavel. I'm Pavel Milewski. <clears throat> I'm ACT Party's candidate for Napier. I'm running a party vote campaign, so this is not about me personally, it's about ACT Party's policies and what it has to offer to New Zealand if the voters choose to put it at the heart of this next government. I am a Polish immigrant, I moved to this country 15 years ago and I am a small business owner. I've been running my own small engineering consultancy in the heart of Napier City for the last 10 years. The reason why I'm with ACT Party is because I believe that only party vote for ACT is what New Zealand needs to deliver real change to this country. We have a fully costed alternative budget that shows how current cost of living crisis could be tackled, how we could uh, reduce the government wasteful spending, how we could reduce the taxes and how we could stop the inflation. We have a crime policy that Hey, is capable of stopping the crime epidemic that we have now, thanks to Labour's prison population reduction targets. We would make sure that criminals face consequences and we would ensure that the victims are at the heart of the justice system. Finally, we would make sure that government services are targeted based on need and not based on ancestry. And that we retain one person, one vote principle in this country. This is why I'm with ACT, and this is why I ask you to party vote ACT this coming election for real change. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for that. It was good to get to know you all a bit and uh, to hear your party's sort of uh, slogans and aims and that. But um, I want to know from each of you, and I'll start with you, Mark, um, what do you think, what, um, what are you personally promising the people of Napier? Um, whether you stand in to get elected or whether you stand in to push the party, what are you personally promising the people? So of I have already released uh, in the last week uh, six pledges of things that I will really commit to to push forward. So I mean, top, the top line though is that my vision for Napier is to make it a place where you know our kids can stay and thrive, and that's going to mean that we need a strong, sustainable, future-focused economy. Uh, it's going to mean that we need to have um, the kinds of social services and infrastructure that everyone needs to thrive here. And it, it becomes the place where really talented people want to come and lead their businesses, um, so uh, run their businesses. And so specifically, the things that I will pledge to advocate for and, and push through for, for Napier would be, we need a 24-7 um, uh, medical centre here. Cyclone Gabriel showed that. Uh, when National shut the hospital here, services got centralised over time to Hastings and we need to reverse that. I've already spoken to Aisha Verrill about that. Um, we need, uh, I'm, I'm very interested in the notion that we might, um, looking at that green and circular economy, that we might uh, put a price on slash, set up a biofuel plant, and the economics create some economics that requires forestry owners to pick that stuff up. Are you going to achieve this if you're a backbencher in the opposition party? I think that I've shown in my career that I can work to get produ productive outcomes. I mean, I've worked in business for 20 years, Andrew, so um, I'm sure that not all of the CEOs and top teams that I've worked with have been Labour voters. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, if anybody wants to, you don't have to dig very deep in industry to find CEOs that have been my referees when I've gone for jobs. Um, and the, the business community knows that I can work across the aisle. Thank you. Martin, you describe yourself as um, a long shot, long shot Langford. Um, <laughs> I'll put, you did call me that in our first interview. <laughs> Do you, um, so you, you genuinely are trying to get 
become the MP of, of Napier. Absolutely. Um, so what are you promising the people of Napier that you will do for them if you are elected? We're a young and small party, so we, we go, we've got to get in when we get in, and we're hoping that Matt King will get his position. I would love it if I got my position here, and then we're in Parliament. We want to keep government honest, so we're going to have to be part of a coalition and be there, be the burr under their saddle, the holly in their underpants, making sure they're going in the right direction. That's what we want to do. For Napier itself, similar to Mark, it's, it's, it's the health, it's the housing, it's the law and order. Um, with health, as said, Cyclone Gabrielle showed that we need better facilities in Napier. Housing, we need to sort out our housing so that we can release our um, hotels and motels for the, for the tourism industry. But those when are your party's promises. What are yeah. you promising the people of Napier? That I will give my all, my efforts to, to be in there and to be not just an advocate, to, but to actually do action, to be there promoting and championing what's best for our region down here. Be in a, we'll be in a coalition. That's what, we're, that's, that's what we're aiming to be, and I'm just going to be there. At the burr under the saddle pushing and saying, this is, what, this is what we need. We need that connect between government and what's happened with, to the people of Hawke's Bay. I feel we've been neglected. There's a lot of hand-wringing and a lot of, oh, we should be doing this. And the, there's action, but there seems to be some inaction which, which really needs to be pushed, and I want to be and making sure. you'll be sure. the Holly in the underpants. Holly in the underpants. He'll be the denier of science. Well, I was interested that he said, like you said, so I was quite interested that Democracy NZ and Labour seem to have similar policies then. Well, no, well, not ideas. at all, because ideas. Labour's policies are based on science and Martin's party's policies are based on um, denying science around how public vaccination programmes work and denying the science of climate change. Um, we only got through because you deflected one of my six priorities, but if you want to come back to the other five later, you can. Well, you can it's do that in your closing if we don't yep. get to yep. it, yes. Now, Julian, you've made it clear that you after the party vote, yep. but what, even in as the representative here, what can you promise Napier, without using party slogans and that, what can you promise um, voters that they'll get if they put Okay, well, in. obviously Napier will benefit from the, the, the national, um, I don't mean national party, <laughs> I mean, uh, national um, initiatives around climate change, and we've seen how hard hit Hawke's Bay was. Specifically, uh, one of the things that I w w w am already advocating for is cleaning up uh, Ahariri Estuary, which is in a terrible and abysmal state, and it needs a lot of work done on it, mm. and also restoring the wetlands in the area. So that's one thing. The other thing is... How will you do that if you're not in Parliament? Because there's other ways in which you can... Well, okay, I'll give you another example. Is about rail. What Hawke's Bay needs is a rail service going all the way, ultimately, from Waiwara down to Wellington. Um, I went to a meeting on Saturday and have joined uh, a lobby group advocating for, uh, for rail for Hawke's Bay. Um, because of my involvement in things like, for example, I'm on the board of Age Concern Hawke's Bay. So one of the things I'm particularly interested in is seniors. <coughs> so, you know, that's, that's a voice that I will have for Napier seniors. Um, and, yeah, okay? Okay, great. Laurie, um, you, you also um, stand in for the party vote. Yes. What can you promise um, Napier voters that... Um, that New Zealand First will deliver for them, not the big yep, that's picture fine. things, but the local things. Well, as you recently knew and interviewed uh, Right Honourable Winston Peters, we had gone and looked at Pukitapu, we had gone and looked at um, the Teradale Stock Bank, which obviously saved Teradale from being flooded using the Provincial Growth Fund. Um, the main thing is that the funding, I think, had run out yesterday for the silt removal, so that's been put on hold. and. We had actually interviewed um, Mary from out in Pukitapu and Winston was quite shocked. So the main, I think the main drive, which would be the initial drive, would be to get the cyclone recovery stuff back on track. It was mentioned about the um, Christchurch earthquake that was 12 whatever years ago and that's still, these guys are still waiting to have their stuff fixed up. Yeah. So Winston was saying that with our provincial growth fund, um, which was $3 billion, that it has now been cut by 80% by the Labour Party to get that reinvigorated, come back and fix up the whole of the cyclone you area. You say your provincial growth fund, it was a Labour coalition government's provincial growth fund. Labour was part of that. If you look at the um, coalition agreement, it actually states that the provincial growth fund, 1,800 new police and the four Poseidon aircraft was, part, was from New Zealand first. Which were all things that Labour was wanting to achieve. 
So, but that's it's, why it's but it's, a but it's, a, it's a New Zealand First provincial. Uh, the provincial growth fund was from New Zealand First. But it wouldn't have happened if uh, Labor didn't. Well, that was one of the, the three parts for win, for New Zealand First to go with the Labor Party was that was the mandate. They had to agree to those three options. Now, Katie, what are you promising to do for Napier? Yeah, well, look, first and foremost, it's about being working with the community. That's, that's the priority, uh, because you don't get anything done on your own. You've got to be connected. You've got to know the issues. You've got to know what people want. Uh, and primarily, uh, that is cyclone recovery. Mm. That is also achieving some major roading infrastructure upgrades. Uh, so some things that I have absolutely dedicated myself to is building the four-lane expressway and not stopping until that's done, upgrading State Highway 5 and upgrading State Highway 2. I have personally made myself a champion for the reallocation of the corridor between Napier and Tutera, because that is absolutely How's uh, through a reallocation of funding in the uh, currently. But it doesn't add up, Auckland. Katie. Yeah, it does. Look, Auckland Light Rail has not been achieved Half by a billion will be the taken current from the government road safety fund. in the last Run. six years. And so we can take the funding of that undelivered project and we can put it into the things that matter. Because I can tell you that people that live in Tinderoto who cannot currently get to work in the same time that they used to, that an extra hour per day, or sorry, an hour per way, a lady is literally rafting across the river to get to work. Those are priorities, not Auckland Light so Rail. I'll and so you, that is what I'm advocating I'll ask for. you the same question I asked Mark. So if the polls turn out not to be right and National is in opposition, you will be sort of backbencher type. Um, how List are you going to get... List MP for Napier. Sorry? List MP based List, on Napier. Well... Well, that's, that's not the job saying. I'm here to. Yeah, that's not the job but I'm anyway, here to go for. Either way, list or actually in. Um, how do you um, <coughs> achieve this if you're Excuse in opposition? Me. Yeah, well, look, it's really important to know the difference between an electorate MP and and you know I I being part of the the current government. I mean, look, we are working really hard to be the government. I am working really hard to be the electorate MP. But the point is, your job is to advocate for the views of the people of your electorate. You are their representative. You are listening to them, and you are representing their views in Parliament. Not your own and so it's really important to know that no matter who is in government hypothetically you are there to represent those people's views and I have shown that I have worked with communities I've worked with industries to grow the view the, the you know the achievements and what and what we want so you've got to be able to work with people to achieve something and that's okay, what it is but, but, but apart from taking from the poorest New Zealanders and the climate fund and the climate adaptation fund to give to the richest. I'm sorry, big what way are we taking from the poorest the New Zealand? Stop ta saying that. $2 we $2 are going to give back more. One at a time. Carry on, one at a time. Well, yeah. t t the, the poorest New Zealanders do the, the worst out of National's tax package, and the ones that do the best are the true. ones that own hundreds of properties. All, that lay, all this back on track <coughs> business is back on track to a world where the wealthiest landlords and foreign investors take over our property market again. How There's already signs that the property market's ready to boom. People's if national rents gets are affordable when there is an open private market of People's rents are properties. affordable in countries where there's enough public housing. So the biggest issue that we people have with We don't need public housing to the scale that you are saying if we have it a off. strong this private market. This exposes what they're doing. As soon as they get in, they're going to switch off our public housing program. Julian, people's people's rents are also say? affordable when you put a cap on rent increases, and the Green Party has a 3% cap on rent. Um, that's when rents become affordable. Look, all the things that Labor has done in the last six years, <coughs> changing tenancy laws, has made rent go up on average $180 a week. The proof is in the pudding. They were advised not to do it, and they have done it. And it has meant landlords are leaving the market, and they're not making rent cheaper. It is well, making rent more expensive. What's your solution there is to less this problem, Pablo? Supply. Well, to the rentals, it's clear that the tenants and the landlords are in a symbiotic relationship. They depend on each other. So the war on landlords that labor has produced over the last couple of years has resulted in the increased rents in it's people exiting in the market and in worse quality of houses. rentals. But it's very simple. It, what you need to do to fix the rent rental market is, is to make sure that the supply possible. meets the demand and that means not disadvantaging one side of the equation, like you've done for the last six years. The core reason for New Zealand's lack of productivity over the last 30 years is we have given a tax tilt towards the residential property market, allowed a class of people, 311 families own as much property as the bottom two and a half million, we're not talking about Mar and Par with one spare rental property that here for their the retirement. That is the majority of our landlords, we, That's actually. the majority in numbers, but the majority of homes are owned by the people that have, can afford a half million dollar donation to the National Party. And I challenge the media 
to take a look at where the money is coming into the political parties and follow up on that because the amount of donations from the property community is obscene and I don't mean I don't at all mean people that are good landlords with one or two properties there are pro people with hundreds of properties but it's their right to do that absolutely anyway, it's no, we're, but we're, putting pressure, we're putting pressure on the market so that prices fall and there are now th that three times as many owner occupiers buying as investors and when national gets back in we're back on track to the oh. place where the big landlords and the foreign investors take over our property market and our kids are locked out. Okay. Housing the, shortage mark, the housing shortage is created by the lack of supply. And, we are and the lack supply. of supply is We're created in New by the land shortage and the shortage the, of infrastructure. Both in the public so and all you need to do is again is just the simple principles of free market. You yeah. need to drive up the supply yes. and first of all everybody will be able to afford the home we and you won't need so many public houses. Supply, yes. Secondly, Can I say something? you'll Can be I just able interject? to we are driving uh, supply. Private renting income, houses yeah. or well, having 20 the, houses will the, not be such Laurie's a great business to anymore. One, one of the issues too is immigration. When you keep bringing in 100,000 people and think that's fine into this country, when there's no houses, it's overstressing the, the schools, the education, the medical system. The idea is to just bring in the people, as, as we've said, bring in the people we need, not the people who need us. We just got to stop, people, we'll stop immigration and just focus on building our country, build our own economy. And of course those people Look, don't help so us to build the country, they all just up. sit around doing we nothing. We need immigration until we address our skill shortage. We have a major skill shortage and we cannot do it on our own and we have and seen that over 2020 and the COVID lockdown. Labour has put 250,000 people of our own people through apprenticeships, 57,000 of those people that wouldn't have got a job otherwise through apprenticeship boost, what about which nurses? we will keep. 8,700 in the last year is the most nurses in New Zealand. We are still 4,800. We've only nurses pay 60%. That'll stop them we moving to Australia. We have to rely on immigration. This is not wasteful but spending. The people we this need. is investing in Just our as you say, core Kate. infrastructure. Martin, you've got I was going back to the housing market, and what's <clears> being brought up is the real estate agents, how the price rise increases is fueled by the billion dollar industry of the real estate agents who are taking that massive cut for a small amount of work. It's, that's something that needs to be looked at as well, as when you've got a, such a hot, a, hot, oh, there we go, a, hot, a hot market, um, that, that's what's driving it. You shouldn't have a house to go up on a market and say, oh, we'll just leave it as, a, as an open, uh, uh, you've got Do to you know what solves it all problem. though, is to increase the supply and it does not need to be government, so, it does not need to be Can we just talk about supply, please? Built. Because oh, the, the facts quickly. on supply, a one in ten homes that are residential dwellings in New Zealand have been built since 2017. We have created a boom in both private and public house building. And the reason we the thing that's really fueled that, and anyone that invests in property should know this, is that we have taken the tax incentives off buying existing stock that hopefully our kids and cleaners and firemen can buy. And we've, the tax incentives are still available if you build new homes. So there's been a record number of privately built new developments all over the place. If anybody's ever tra travelled around, you'll see them. Why we've built 18,000 public homes, 5,000 5, uh, transitional and over 13,000 uh, public homes. There's another 4,500 being built right now and there's another four or 5,000 planned. Okay. So okay. why have, why have off. we got, why have we got, hundreds, said why have we got hundreds and hundreds of people Still living in motels, yeah. still Thousands. sleeping in their cars. Okay. Thousands. Uh, can I tell you why, Laurie? And it's, it's two why? things. Tell me why. In the, in the John Key era, in which area? No, no. What about John Key? That's you're going way back in time. I'm coming to your what about now? Point. The population You've had six of New years Zealand, to do this. Six the years. New Zealand went up 800,000. We didn't build a single new school, a single new hospital, train enough doctors or nurses. So the so-called wasteful spending is actually us catching up on the population no. okay. going up. 800,000 people. I want to hear from Julian. Just go back to your point about rent caps and that. A lot of economists say that it doesn't work. Works in Germany. Why do you think it would work? Well, not it in might Germany, work in Mark. Germany, different uh, economy to us. Why do you think it would work here? Well, it works for tenants, believe you me. It works for them and it works in other countries. And there's, why should landlords be entitled to put their rents up at will. For example, when they sell a property, then they just decide, well, we'll get rid of that tenant and get another tenant in and we can put the rent up. Yep. The Green Party policy is that you can't put it up more than 3% even if you change tenants. It still can only go up by 3% by a year. But people buy it as an investment, so they need to be making a return exactly. on the Exactly. Costs continue the to go up. They're making a return on the property itself. 
uh, by the, the, the property going up and there being no capital gains tax whatsoever. So the fact that there is no property gains tax means that property speculators and people who buy more and more properties are the ones who become wealthier and so wealthier. So what do you say to the landlord that is now making loss on his property? Sell it. Because he cannot raise the price. Sell it. And, and what? Uh, because at the yeah. moment, some of those properties have five or six people in them. Mm. They sell it. A first-home buyer buys it, which is a great thing. But where do the effect of four odd what other people if, go? What happens if the landlords that have hundreds of properties need to sell a few to make their other homes healthier? Or to make the... To, to, to Actually, you know what? Private what landlords what are the is, best it puts landlords. Downward pressure on the cost or of don't meet their own healthy home standards. Yeah. You don't understand what we're trying to do. We are trying to lower, over time, the price of houses. Yeah, we're trying the to make way to achieve it is by building more houses. The, and what yeah. you're Not assuming is that these people, people yeah. that are New willing Zealand, and uh, able well are right. going to stay in New Zealand and deal with this. They when, will take their investments yeah, over And you, you say great. sell it, but there are people who can't New afford Zealand their own home and they have to rent. So what do you say to people who are stuck in the rental market when you're forcing landlords to sell properties? We'll go back to a time when a primary school teacher like my mum can buy a house. Okay, well let's see how we get with that. Um, now, what personal characteristic do you, Mark, have that you believe will attract voters to vote for you as MP or for your party? Well, I think I'm honest. I think I'm independent thinking. I think I'm pretty hard working and tenacious. And I'm smart enough, to, enough to join the dots. And I think that, um, you know, I don't, I, the hard thing about this job for me is I don't, I'm not, have not been a self-promotionist and I think that, you know, I'd invite people to have a look at my track record and look at the people that I've worked with and, you know, senior business leaders will say that I'm pretty courageous in saying what I think and that, um, you know, I'll, I'll challenge people and that, that would be within my party or on the other side of the aisle. I'm, I, I'm an independent thinker. Okay. Mm. I've Same spent, for you. Yeah, absolutely. I've spent my whole career listening. We have two ears and one mouth, so you listen <laughs> more than you speak. With and someone's I mouth open. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I could just get away with it. Absolutely. I've, I've got the advantage. Um, it's listening, because you listen to a medical history. You listen to people's problems. You, 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 you nut it out. Um, and that's what I found over the last few years. I've actually been doing more counselling than dentistry, because people hey, came with problems. that's my job. Uh, the psychologist. Well, I'm, yeah, probably do a better job. <laughs> because I'm also, and people laugh, oh, a critical thinker. Um, I can see through the boulder dash of the way that the, yeah. the vaccine and the COVID response. And uh, that's what's put thinker me in this. not believe science, Mark? It's, it's science. It's evidence of ideology. And it is believing in science and saying, this doesn't stack up. My personal um, uh, equipment protective equipment, after 30 years of using it, I was told um, in 2020, it doesn't work any longer. It's you've got probably to change, time for an update You've got to change your mask. Of the same. You've got to well, no, and now we're back onto it because it works. <laughs> it got me through flu seasons. And what is COVID? <laughs> Just a flu. It's a variation of the flu. Um, it got me through well. flu seasons and I was told, oh no, sorry. Um, what else was that? Was that your comment then? No, that's all good. Oh, okay. okay. Now, Julian, I know you're not standing to be MP, but sh you are, are the public face of the Green Party, yeah in um, Napier, what characteristic do you have that will attract people to vote for? I, I spent a lot of time, as I said, working in the disability and mental health field and saw a lot of disadvantage. I'm passionately committed to things being fair and I always have been. That was how I was raised and that's what I continue to do. Um, as a, a manager, all my employees, um, when I left both the organisations where I was a senior manager, um, were incredibly complimentary because I, I'm, I am fair, I am reasonable and I'm compassionate and, um, and I, I really, really believe that everybody deserves a fair deal in this world. Not that some people have more and then they get more and more and more and some people have less and get less and less and less. I'm also <coughs> passionate about the environment. I spend all my holidays um, walking or um, in forests and deserts or wherever and I just absolutely love our beautiful planet and I, I may be quite old but it doesn't mean to say that I think oh well I'm going to die soon so I don't care I do care yeah. even beyond my lifespan I want this beautiful planet to continue and future generations to thank be able you. to enjoy it thank you Laurie same question to you what is it about you that is going to make people say wow and to vote for oh, you I, I just I think I've just got that I'm the just what are, I'm that type of person that just <laughs> warm that people warm to me. Can okay. I say that? Yeah. So um, I can vouch for that. Yeah. So it's just I think I'm a good listener. Been married twice. I've sort of learned to be a good <laughs> listener. Um, Some may say you didn't listen. Well, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> no, I did. I do listen. But no, to me, it's about um, bringing. 
oh, it's, just, it's just going out and talking to people about what they feel about the country. It's talk, listening to the voters. Um, and most of the people I'm talking to say, look, we just, this, something needs to change. This country's just heading in the wrong direction. We really need to bring back democracy. We really need to bring back where everybody has a, has a free choice. Yeah. Like the policies that have been pushed through now, they were never gone through to the public to make a decision on. Three Waters, co-governance, it was just done. That never came and asked us. So well, we'll it's about listening. Those. Yeah, it's, we'll, it's we'll just get listening. We'll those. Katie, either way, you probably are going to be in Parliament, um, yeah. whether you win the seat or you're on list. I know you don't want to be no, a list. Let me, yeah, I'll Go be very list. clear about that. I'm here to be the but, electorate MP. But on polls, you probably will be. So what yes. will you personally yes. promise a local issue that you will champion for um, for the voters. So probably going back to the question we had before, I mean, I, I'm committed to, to Hawke's Bay. Yeah, sorry, and yeah. your characteristics. Yeah, what okay, well, I'll, I'll address both because, <laughs> of course, you know, the entire northern end of Hawke's Bay needs to be better connected. So that is probably first and foremost, putting cyclone recovery into that. Okay. We need to be better connected. Uh, we need to make sure that we are booming industry um, because that's where high value jobs come from. So th those are the things that I will be championing hard. And but the my characteristics, you have, yeah. look, I mean, for me, I put people first. Everybody that knows me knows that I am deeply empathetic. I care about people and I listen. I make myself available uh, you know, to, to anyone all the time, um, to my husband's distaste sometimes. <laughs> you know, I am uh, extremely accessible and I think that is the, that's the message I want to give Thank people, you. is you stop me any time you call me any time and I will be there to hear your concerns and take those to Parliament. When you're MP, you might get a bit sick of that. But no, we'll no, but that's the job. no, but that is mm. the job. That is what when I'm I signing up when, for. She will be either way. It's a but th this is why I'm signing up for this job and I need to make sure people understand that. Mm. It is not about me. It is about them and that exactly. is why I'm doing this job. My entire life has been in service and I'm here to continue that all Great. the time. Thank you. Pavel, what characteristic do you have that people are going to say, wow, Pavel makes me want to vote for him? <laughs> uh, well, I'm running a party vote campaign, but yes, I mean, I, I think that. we are having a little bit of a skill shortage in the parliament. Yeah. I understand there's only two engineers in parliament at the moment, which is not enough in a country that is so short in, of infrastructure and understanding how it can be delivered. I'm a structural engineer. I've been a structural engineer all my life. I practiced in here and in the UK, in other countries. So even not being an MP, we talk to each other within ACT. And those MPs who are in parliament from our party are supported by the expertise of those who are supporters further on the list. So I believe I can contribute with that. I so, understand. So your involvement with ACT doesn't stop when these elections are over? No, no, no. It didn't start when I became a candidate okay. and it doesn't stop uh, after okay. that. Still, I'm asking for party votes only, okay. but of course, all of us, all 60 people on the list of ACT, yeah. support those who get into the parliament. We yeah. work as a team okay. and we all feel accountable to New Zealanders for what we're pro promising to deliver. Now, something really we've all touched on is the cost of living, yeah. and I'm sure there's going to be a robust debate on that. Just keep it clean if we can. So, um, you, much has been made of it and how to help the squeezed middle, as some people call it. Um, so how will you do that, Mark Hutchinson? Look, so there's two approaches to, 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 to dealing with this issue, right? And National's one, which is to put tax across the... Uh, I think he's asked about yours. No, no but I'm just, uh, yeah. there's two approaches. This is macroeconomics, right? If you put tax cuts into people's pockets, you will fuel inflation, which will cause interest rates to go up. The biggest harm to people that I've knocked on thousands it's of dollars It's an adjustment now, of the tax The market. biggest harm to people yeah. has been the rent and um, mortgage increases that are caused by interest rates being it's high, mortgages being high. So, oh. um, and so Dave's approach is to do the opposite, which is instead of fueling the economy by shoving more money into it. Isn't is that to, what the Labour government is to doing now? is to yep. chip a bit of cost of everything, right? right so we're chipping a bit of fruit and veg, a bit of you're going borrowed money. Add cost Enabling to kids, tax people to, to get their kids into to early childcare means that some families will be able to have two people working, which is a massive <sighs> benefit. So prescription charges off, and uh, you know, as I, as I, as I, people are now starting to wake up to this, and they're saying, oh, National's giving me a little bit with this hand, but actually they're taking away more. Where's the actual money going in the tax cut plan? We it's are going to the, going to the people that need it. We are giving, the prescriptions are going to be targeted be to community service cardholders and super gold cardholders, the people that need it. any sensible economist, in fact any economist, and they'll say those tax cuts will be inflationary, they'll be eaten within a year. Those Shouldn't, are um, not, actually by the way, I just want to clarify, they're not tax cuts, they are tax bracket adjustments, mm. which will provide relief for people to inflation, I'm because they tax brackets have not 
been adjusted to inflation. I'm not against tax bracket adjustments. It's just the wrong time to do it. It's the equivalent of you've got a fire in the kitchen and you tip fat and petrol on it. You don't throw tax cuts at an economy where you are just putting out inflation. It's, 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 it's the wrong move. A tax bracket adjustment. Don't you think it's better money spent than giving uh, free prescriptions actually putting money to cancer? to widen the net of uh, Absolutely. Of pharma. So we've put a billion extra, we've put a lot of 51% extra funding and we've committed to another billion for Pharmac. So the, 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 the thing about Pharmac, if you want to talk about Pharmac, is that it's, it's important that politicians don't make um, decisions, interfere in decisions one drug at a time. Pharmac's job, and it works very well, and that's why the big oh pharmaceutical companies God. don't like it, is to make the yeah. best of, of what it has. So our approach is, give Pharmac more money, there will not be more money for Pharmac under National's plan. Okay, Martin. Food, food, going and filling up your, sh uh, your shopping cart uh, at the supermarkets, we need one more competition. Uh, we need to get more of our homegrown produce, which is first rate, rather than exporting the, our best quality, keeping that in the supermarkets, and stop bashing our food producers with taxes on the food producers. So and you saying, believe that from the food producers to the supermarkets, there's a big mark up there? It's it, why you always go into a supermarket and why the fruit and veg always the first aisle you go through, because that's where they do their biggest markup. You are always channeled through fruit and veg before you get to the rest of the supermarket. <coughs> Check in each, each supermarket you go to, and that's where they're doing it. And so that's why we've got to be looking after our, our food producers and not tax them so so it's actually cheaper from source that they're not being um, overbear overbought because they're, they're ready to give up their their lands um, if they're going to keep on being bashed by the big government who's coming in and saying that you are the the bane of all evil you are our polluters you are our biggest polluting industry um, we've got to be looking after our farmers we've got to protect them because they are important you are what you eat J Julian I suspect that you would almost half agree with what Martin's saying especially on the lower food prices eh? Well, I certainly would agree about supermarket competition. Yeah. Um, and I would also agree that, that suppliers yeah. need to get a fair deal for their produce and, and that um, we need to look at supermarket profits. I would agree on that. Mm. Um, are you asking me for more? Yeah, yeah so yeah. Uh, the, cost of, the yeah. cost of living crisis, yes. how, how do you solve well, it? Yeah. We will rebalance the whole tax system. At the moment, we have a situation where the people who earn the most, those 311 um, families that Mark talked about, uh, pay an effective tax rate of 9.5%, the which is less than half the standard rate of tax. And so we will rebalance the whole thing with a wealth tax, uh, with a higher rate of top tax, and with a lower rate of, uh, of the bottom. $10,000 for everyone will be tax-free. There will be um, an income guarantee of $385 a week with an extra $135 for solo parents, um, that for, for, parent, for students and anyone out of work. Um, we will make sure that um, the health service is much more affordable. One of the ways of doing that is to make sure that more health service is provided in the public sector rather than the private sector where you siphon off yeah. a certain amount of money. We'll make sure that homes are more energy efficient so people are paying less yeah. uh, for their energy. Um, and there was one more thing which I've... Well, oh, you can get back to it later. Okay. Laurie, I think yeah. um, most people here yeah, would agree more competition uh, yes. in supermarkets is... Um, is Achieve yeah, well, I think I think our guideline was that um, I think it's foodstuffs who own uh, it's actually owned by overseas companies. Yeah. So we don't actually own their own it's food aggressive. industries. So the thing is, it's to look at those guys. If, if they're if they're overseas and they can just charge what they like, so you have to really have a look at how they structure their processes, how they structure their costing, and also it was about the banking industry. Also, we're owned overseas. Our banks are owned by overseas industries. we really got to look at that because these banks are just charging astronomical fees that they're charging more in New Zealand than they are in the countries that own the banks. So you come from Wairau. How do you help the average person in Wairau who's struggling to make ends meet at the moment? Well, again, it's about the food costs. As I said, those are the things you need to address. And I think one of the other things that we mentioned was the price of fuel going over $3. Everybody's been talking about tax on fuel, tax on fuel, tax on fuel. But if there's, because um, all our fuel comes in from overseas, and if there's any sort of um, political going on in South China Sea or Singapore Sea, and those boats stop coming to New Zealand, we've only got enough fuel, I think it's for five or six days. So that was the whole agenda, was to get Marsden Point back working, produce our own fuel. It was sold to an Australian company who, 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 who destroyed it. So, what we so need we really work. need to look at building our own, we need to make, 
their own fuel in New Zealand. It's well, we just more electric cars and yeah. not having the clean car discount removed. Well, electric by cars, nobody knows the sure. batteries. That Arguably, for Wairoa, what's going to reduce their cost of living is actually having services in yeah. their town. They don't have to drive out of town mm. to go to the bank, to go to the dentist, mm. to go to their choice of you have doctor. No dentist. You know, they, they don't have those services there. And so, There's you no know, the cost of living for them is making their services inaccessible and they have to use their cars. And at the moment, mostly four wheel drives for many mm. of them to get out of the area. Yeah, to be able to access those services. So, you know, connecting them back with the services and bringing those services back into Wairau would be How a first step. There's, there's, there's no dentist tanks. and one doctor. So another thing too was to get the, to get the infrastructure back. The roads, um, Winston Peters drove from Wairau down here and he couldn't believe how, how shocking the roads were. Well, also, we the the get, the, lines, get so. the rail system back. It's not just about pull a wire or stuck in getting a hard time, we also got to start moving, you know, to get out of wire. As Katie's, we have we have no dentist, we have no doctor. There's no there's not one bank left in wire. There's a couple of ATMs. So we really need to start looking back and getting I'm those small towns. I'm a strong advocate for better public services too, but Katie, can you make a commitment to now to what National will actually spend on improving <coughs> services in Wairau? Well, because I, have I see a sinking lid on health costs in their budget. That is absolutely not true. We have committed to year on year, but thanks for giving me the opportunity to say this, <laughs> year on year increasing funding to healthcare and education. Here we want to prioritise mm. the front line, and the front line is what's happening in Wairau, and that's not what's funded now. But also but it doesn't need to be public funded it could be private the dentist if you encourage for a dentist to go in there either provide them with accommodation make them part of the community yeah. it doesn't necessarily come down to the bottom line of what their cost is a private dentist would go back into Wairoa it's just at the moment it's not that attractive to be a private dentist that's the people coming here now Katie one of the ways your party is going to fund the tax cuts is taking some of the budget away from benefits so how are you actually helping people that are struggling on the benefits, yep. how are they going to get through the cost of living So I prices? continue to say the best help they can have is help into a productive and high value job. Because at the moment... And why does National never invest in that? No, look, at the oh. end of the day, staying on the benefit is not the best thing for these families. Being Correct. in employment is the best thing. And we are noting that there are so many people that are stuck on the job the seeker unemployment benefit and we need to help them off. Mm. And if we don't set targets for these, and, and like every in other sector, whether it's healthcare or education, we need to set targets to get people so off let, benefits. So let me put it to you. Someone goes to work, um, having never worked, they go to an orchard to uh, pick fruit and that. They get fired in the first day because they're just not up to it or whatever. What do you do to the, with them then? Do they kick off the benefit? What no, absolutely not. So what do you do? They so continue to get now. support. They get the training that they are required or that they need to have to get they into get a job. They get an orange or a, or a red or No, a green look, it's important to know that after six months, if they are continuing to avoid getting into work, that we will give them additional support. That is what this is about. It is what a supportive support social investment what if program. That training doesn't help? So if that doesn't help, then we need to get in there and help them manage their money and we need to get them into community so, work because they've got to get an entry level into that work because so it is a job seeker unemployment benefit. So why when in government did National cut the training incentive allowance which helped solo mums like Paula Bennett get off Paula Bennett. the dole and into Parliament? We are going to Parliament. continue to support low income Judge families. Judge politicians by what their parties do when they're in power, not what they say. Oh, Kate, it's God, easy to sit here and say everything's like rubbish Like what you haven't be achieved better. in the last six years? But there is, yes, there's been a lot of, we've leaned into a lot of difficult change. It's not perfect, but we're heading in the right direction. I What's disagree. your take on this, Pavel, on uh, getting people out of the cost of living crisis? Helping well, I mean, it's it's it starts with my macroeconomics, like Thanks. Mark said except that the main driver of the inflation in New Zealand is wasteful government spending. The place Correct. has been flooded by borrowed money mm. by the government. So and this is why this is a great Mark, when too much money chases too little produce, because we've not increased our productivity, but we've printed a lot of money, so Mark's you, point you, get, what, price, what you get price you increases. Explain so what do you need cut. to do? is you need to spend the wasteful spending. If your spending, was, spending of, though, if you your spending was of any value, in Parliament. then <laughs> we wouldn't have this inflation. The fact that we have 11% of the is actually... Can I finish, please? The fact that we have 11% inflation is a proof that your spending was wasteful. Why is the wasteful spending unless you say What is the wasteful spending? If you spend more money and produce more for that money, then it's not wasteful spending and you don't get inflation. If you spend yes, more money to mm. produce the same amount of stuff, 
Martin, you were saying what the is administration. I mean, how many thousand, how many jobs were created in the Beehive or in Parliament for 14, the admin? Fourteen thousand. Fourteen thousand yeah. adminers. How come we're going to um, and what's we're going to specialists Nothing. or uh, what do you call it, researchers, and saying, oh, we'll, we'll give you your opinion because Disgust. we haven't got opinion in the Parliament, so we will actually be in, having. Um, Consultants, that's it. Consultancy. So I can yeah. tell you what we're going to reduce. And these are really good so at look, what I'm we're going to reduce is 6.5 percent of expenditure in, in um, most public sector. Which is and, a lot. And no, but look, it's important because it, we are we are saying that if those jobs, if those back office jobs are not directly impacting frontline services, then they need to be reduced. What, what, because we have good, seen an inflation. We have seen an inflation of support to, services in Wellington that are not not helping the front They won't line. say what they'll cut. They're saying they're going to leave it to the poor bureaucrats to well, do it. Of they said, oh, we'll leave the managers in the public service That's the operating Just budget. That's down how it works. Six and a half percent is a deep budget. cut. It's on the website. It says what we're going to cut, and it's not going to be a single nurse, but I single cop, for the people of Hawke's Bay now, Pevel. What are you going to cut? No, not, we, we're what not going to cut privatize? any frontline services. Uh, You've made it easy for us scale. by accumulating all the wasteful bureaucracy in yes. Wellington. That's what we're going to cut. I think you'll find yes. that those that, that is a lot less wasteful bureaucracy than you'd imagine, especially after no, the war. Fourteen thousand. Oh my God! What's your view on this? How many of you have worked with CEOs of state sector organisations? I have. I've also, worked, I've also worked. I've also worked at local government okay, and worked with government Julian's agencies view. as well. As a consultant, I've done change I management, mate. Oh, we cut wasteful spending. You'd be capped, Katie, because you're a consultant to the Hawke's Bay Regional Council. No, I'm not. Well, you were. You were transferred. That's consultant. it. She's changed well, her job. Well, I think there's. Well, several Lucky things I'd like to say. they don't have to cut me then. First, I'd like to say to Laurie that to say, what have they done in the last six years? Nothing. I mean, if that's the level of political discourse, God help rubbish. us. Clearly, that's not true. Um, the other thing I'd like to say in terms of cutting wasteful spending is that people can't actually identify. Act goes well, on all the time, and National go on all oh, the time, about cutting red tape, cutting red tape, cutting budget. red tape, as though red tape is somehow our enemy and that red tape is automatically a bad thing and that everybody out there will agree that we're really good guys because we're going to cut and cut and cut and cut red tape. What is this red tape? So look, it's 14,000 extra bureaucrats who do nothing. I haven't no, finished. No, no. And help well, red tape is basically regulations which set standards for things that need to be done. And I happen to know that those parties will be cutting regulations to lower environmental um, yeah, standards, um, to lower like working conditions standards, and to... Um, Could you give me an example, Julian? Yeah, okay. okay. So from in terms of wasteful yard. spending, every organisation, including the government departments, including councils, clearly need to look at their regulations and their paperwork requirements in order to make sure Sure that they're fit for purpose. They need to be looking regularly at their jobs. Do we really need to do this job or not? I'm not arguing that those things don't happen, but just to simply say we need to be cutting red tape, we need to be cutting wasteful spending without actually ever identifying what that wasteful spending actually is. And I also think it shows a complete lack of understanding of what goes on in those back rooms. Well, cuts so, them we are so well for the Green Party ETS? because Labour has actually cut some of the climate programmes as well without even telling James Shaw what you have to say about can, that. Can we just finish on red tape before we come to climate, which I'm happy to do. So, well, no, so we, we, we we've just done it. We'll move on now. On this point. Yes, yeah? I, it's disappointing, I have to say. I, you know, I, I feel as though the Labour Party is actually the only party, other party in this room that actually does care enough about the environment. But it oh, is no, disappointing that's not that true. Labour decided totally wrong. to do something yeah. um, to cut the programme. I'm bringing in two change. Okay, I don't we'll believe in climate, climate change chaos soon. crisis. Mark, oh, two hello. Points. So, two points on, on, on red tape. The last uh, bonfire of red tape that National brought us brought us the leaky homes crisis by loosening up building regulations for their developer friends who were funding them back then as well. Oh, let's go um, to the and, future. And they had go, they've gone on Can't. and on, and Katie still says she'll, she'll re repeal the RMA. Under the key uh, government, for nine, two two nine years, years they didn't do anything yeah, about the two, RMA, 2 and we have actually um, we completely re revised a very difficult area, and it needs to be given a chance, and I've spoken to RMA lawyers, mm. it needs to be given a chance to operate. Do you know what, RMA lawyers have actually said that they're going to help us rework what it is that David Parker put in an absolute Frankenstein of an RMA it's terrible. if you go out there and talk to the people that absolutely it's underpin our country. economy it is unworkable and we cannot operate on it so moving on uh, to the big issue of Hawke's Bay is the cyclone recovery and um, how a lot of people have different opinions of how it's been handled and that 
Uh, there has been a lot of criticism, Mark, of the way the Labour government has handled it. Um, you speak to different sectors. Um, the orchardists weren't particularly happy how they were handled. People who live in, in Category 3 um, homes are not really happy about the way things are being done there. What do you say about that? So the first thing I'd say is that, you know, it was um, a catastrophic weather event spread across, you know, a very wide area, um, and that people have been hit hard. And you know, my heart goes out to people. I mean, I, I know people that were personally affected, and it's been awful. Um, I'd say that in terms of the government's response, we're up to nearly a billion dollar of investment in, in Hawke's Bay now in cyclone recovery. Um, the local councils and regional council all said unanimously, with one voice, we don't want government to impose this on us. We, we want you to walk alongside us and support a locally led recovery. I think there's been some learnings in that. Uh, so it was kind of like doing the opposite of the Sarah approach in, in Christchurch. I would argue that um, you need to take, because this is precedent setting, because of the scale of it and the future implications for retreat, um, the, 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 the land decisions need to be got right. Um, and you know, I've, I know somebody personally who I went to school with who, who lives in um, Parker Wai, whose who's, who's property has gone in and out of two and three and is now back in two. There's big decisions to be taken around you know, um, whether we create floodplains, whether we change where stock banks are or raise them. And those take time because they, they, they But these are people's lives. If you're living yeah. in your in your mother in law's house or in yeah. a caravan somewhere, I, abs I absolutely appreciate that. You know, this that. is your life that we're talking but, about. But, uh, you know, uh, of all of the, the post weather event recovery areas, Hawke's Bay is actually doing going the fastest. And you know, if you look at where, say, somewhere like Christchurch would have been this far after the major earthquake, you know, it took years to sort out some yeah. of the land zoning decisions. So um, it's not been perfect. I think that there's, you know, there's, for example, there's a big review of civil defence because civil defence is also run locally. And well, there are two you know, reviews. There's a local yeah. review and a national review. Yeah, that's right. So there's there's a bunch of learning that needs to happen out of this, and we we learnt, I guess, uh, the, the government of both colours learnt a lot from the Christchurch how to deal with a massive earthquake. Now we need to learn because these things are going to get more frequent, and I, I guess that. Um, um, it is, it's certainly not the time to be taking money out of the Climate Resilience Fund to, to give to wealthy landlords. Oh. You know, it's just not. Well, we'll, we'll get on to the whole climate change thing. I see Martin roll in his eye. Uh, yes, I will. That, 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 that yep. Cyclone Gabriel is climate change, but we will get on to that. But w what do you think could have been done differently, Martin, in the It's recovery? the comment that the central government was going to let the local government have, have more control and st walk with them. The money, it was the money that was the problem because the local council saying we haven't got the facilities, we haven't got the resources mm. and central government said oh well just let you, 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 you muddle it out basically. So you, you had a lot of delays and such forth and, and the councils that couldn't actually cope with it because the government wasn't giving them enough support. Do you think that was a tactic by the oh. central government just to pass the buck to with the local With all due respect, think, Wapakata, I, he did a wonder. pretty good job of getting the roads up and running I thought. But that's, a, a, that's central though, that we, you're talking about having this localised and Martin's point is having localised. You can't say no, hey local you deliver it, but we're not going to tell you how much money yeah. we're going to give you yeah. until another month and another month and a month. You can't but drip feed it. He helped with a lot of d roads that weren't their responsibility yes. because they abutted to state highways. I mean, you can't say the government did nothing. Why are we still waiting think for $12 million learned, dollars they were promised? I think what we've learned is that there's out a the capability rates. missing. Okay, we'll get back so, to Martin. Uh, <laughs> there we go. So I had, had a, a colleague who was um, an architect. And he said that it was quite an easy thing to have looked at where the flood... He said even the next day you could have looked at that, that, that footage and said this is where the floodplains are in, out in Esdale and this is where, you know, this is the high tide line basically of where <coughs> the flooding is. There were decisions that could have been made way back then, but instead the people have been put through. We're having a meeting in six what weeks. What decisions would have been made? That, 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 whether you're going to be a two or a three, because there were people out there who were living in their houses and had knock on the door saying, you've got to get out and you've got to evacuate. And said, well, the water's gone down. The water's receded. Our houses are, no, you are classed as a zone three. You've got to get out. And this, this is their personal experience. And they said, well, we're refusing to move. If we refuse to move, are we in trouble? Well, there'll be someone back to see you. They stayed in their house. Their house did not get flooded. Their land off the road. They weren't they were off the road and they were unflooded. So you've got silly decisions going on. People going around um, doing admin that wasn't really helpful for people. You put, them, you put people in, in risk and say, well, where do we go? We're going to leave our property. We're leaving our other properties there. We're taking the people who are renting with us. Where do we go? And so, you, so you've got people making silly decisions. No one was really taking control. You had the hubs who were run by volunteers who did a fantastic job. And then you had people saying, oh, we'll get the, um, the outside guys in. You go in there and you sort out the civilians. Now, I know this Australian team came in, started talking to the guys out at Bayview, 
And they said, you carry on, because you're actually doing a really good job here. And so they said, you carry on because this is fantastic. And what the council worker did came and said, oh, you can't be putting those names in a bin because that's privacy issues. You've got to have a shredder to put those. And he said, I don't think these families that here, here, and here that I've just put in the bin um, a matter two jots about their names being on a piece of paper. That's how nitpicky the council had been. This is how stupid it can get when in, a situ in, a, in a situation where there's stress. Um, OK, Julian, what, what, what do you think could have been done better in the recovery? I'm sure lots could have been done better, and I'm sure there will be a review to tell that. Yeah. I, I, in terms of the initial thing, and given the scale of the problem and how unexpected it was, I think that communities, councils and the government actually did a reasonably good job. I do understand that for individual people who are still waiting for things to happen, they will look back and say, but this didn't happen, that didn't happen. So I'm looking forward to an actual independent review coming out um, mm. that looks at all of these things and says, well, what could we have been done better in order to meet things for the future? And a couple of things I'd like to say, I mean, actually, you said we're going to get back to this, is about actually building more resilience for the future, but we're going to come back yeah. to that, we'll I believe. Back to that. And the other thing, as part of that, is there are a huge number of decisions to be made, and you can't rush them. Things like, you know, where you're going to rebuild, are you going to rebuild, zoning, all of that needs really careful thought. It can't be rushed, so we need to take the time we need. And I understand that for individual people who have lost things, and I happen to know quite a lot of them as well, mm. it's frustrating and I'm sure that more can be done for yeah. the individuals in that situation. But I wouldn't want to rush into any knee-jerk knee reaction in terms of the yeah. longer-term planning. Now, Laurie, the key to all this is money. Yes. Wairau needs a ton load of money yes. to, to get back. And we've invested a lot in Wairau. In yes. So what more can be done, do you think? Well, Where I guess it's, it's one of these things that, should it, when it happens, you just go, oh my God, what is this? So again, it's about being ready for these things, but this sort of stuff, it's just difficult because it's so big, it came so fast and so strong. And Craig was telling me, the Mayor of Wairau, obviously you just got to get things done. You can't sit around thinking, oh, I've got to talk to this guy. They had a lot of stuff that was in place. A lot, Of course, it's the community. They've worked through a lot of um, different events in the past, but this was such a major event that it was just, God, it was just overwhelming. The thing is now, that um, work is being done, it's just slowly ticking over, and as I said, they need to have a look at how we can do things better in the future. The biggest thing with Craig was that they had to spend money to get things done. They, um, it was a discussion between them and the Regional Council, and now the money's not coming, and Wairau um, District Council now owns over, owes over $12 million, and they still have to pay that off, and they don't have the money to pay it. Yeah. So it's just a matter of streamlining the support and the finances after these things happen. Okay, you can look back and think we should have done this, they could have helped, they could have done this better, but it's the funding and the communication, telling people what's going on, when we're going to do it, not just to say at a meeting, oh, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. They need timelines. They need yep. to know when things are going to be done. Katie, I'm sure you've got a lot to say on what the yeah. government has done wrong. Well, look, and you know what, most importantly, it, it, I have made it my job to connect with communities. So it's yeah. not just about saying, oh, I know someone personally that's been affected. My job as a representative is to connect with the people that are suffering and make sure I'm hearing them because they don't feel heard. And yes, we have two reviews, but only one of them is actually going to listen to the people. And that is the first issue. So, look, I think <clears throat> going back to how things were done in the, in the immediate aftermath, that has been done. We can do a lot to learn from that. We can do a lot to make sure we do it better next time and, and we can get to that um, when the time is right, you know, once the review is done. However, when we're talking about people's very real issues right now, and I'm talking to them all the time, we are constantly in touch, they need to be heard and they aren't. And so we want to introduce a tool, a vehicle for their case to be heard because you can't just arbitrarily draw What's a line. Vehicle? So that's an ombudsman. It's just so the bureaucracy. Isn't that just Bureaucracy? No, it's look, got, it's not. It's an independent reviewing body because at the moment the ombudsman that exists there is a currently a five-year wait time to have your case seen. So we need to introduce that because unfortunately the power has been now. given. The power has been given to regional councils, district councils, but funding is drip-fed. So the councils can only do so much in what they've got to make sure they're making the best decision. I understand that, this but every single property is different. To Every single point, property is will different. Will this slow things down? No, it won't. Yes, Look, it because, will. No, because at the end of the day, 
These people will fight and fight and fight if they do not believe their voice is being heard. If they get an independent review that tells them, actually, this is the situation, this is the best possible outcome you can get, that is going to help things move along. Because otherwise people who are decision. in pain, it's, it's who are suffering, Wellington will continue to beat a dead horse. We've got to help them get another opinion. It's creating another Wellington bureaucracy, and no, that's not what not. we need. Oh. We need to support local leaders to make good decisions, consulting but with the communities that they're working for. And they're, they're not for. consulting with the community, though. Well, that's that the bit the that needs point. fixing. We don't don't need an Quite right. But at the moment, what is happening is the government is drip feeding funding, but they are not listening to their community. And a perfect example is infrastructure funding. When they get emergency works, Waka Katahi say, yep, we will give you the funding, but you can only use it to get the, the road back to exactly the condition it was in before. They cannot improve. And so back to the point of resilience, when this happens again, we have not done anything to make sure we are protecting ourselves for the next event. We are only just going back to what we, we had. We had to get the roads up and running pretty quickly, and a Bailey Bridge was never going to be a permanent solution, right? Now, Pavel, I mean, you're an engineer. There yep. were some bridges that were one in 500 years, and they were gone. They were washed away like we'll nothing. Um, yeah, how do, how do you even metres. build up, you know, how do you even get the infrastructure to a level where it stops events like well, this? Well, it is obvious that climate change is real and it is obvious that we need to build resilience into our infrastructure. And I think everybody agrees to that. The problem no, is that at the moment, uh, the, yes, the funding is the issue and the councils don't have security of funding. So what we would do, we would share the GST with councils to make sure that they have a clear funding going forward, not just for tomorrow, but for the years to come. And what would to be plan the infrastructure the GST away from And the also for the infrastructure that we can't afford, because the truth is that we are behind with infrastructure for various reasons. We would make a list of infrastructure that's going to be built, that is required to be built. Then on this list, we would look at what can be funded from the public funds. And the remainder would be open to contest by private investors through so private what, public partnerships. And uh, we would build it as a, as a toll road. It doesn't have to be a road. No, no, All no, kind no. Of How is that going to work for rural communities? Roads. Well, because it's going to most work for rural communities because you're going to communities. deliver infrastructure faster. Of course, if you're building a toll road, you have to have an alternative road. This but there's plenty tax. of this places will be a tax on rural where this can be introduced. Well, you, have you asked Waro? Than, no, than no, no, no. You talk to the people on the ground, everybody is happy paying a, a little bit of a toll if they can have, have a first world road so who, built. And it doesn't mean so stopping who's building the, the road, roads. Pavel? Who well, will own as the you roads? know, the way private Chinese, pub public partnerships The Chinese works. will end up owning the roads. No, not I think Chinese. We've found a point to agree Actually, on Actually, New Zealand Superfund is keen to invest <coughs> in New Zealand infrastructure. Now. So how about that? Christopher and they Lutz will not own it in the, he indefinitely. They will own it for a finished period of time. After it's paid off, this road is going to become the normal state road. So it's very easy. The only All of benefit these is that instead of building this road costs. in 30 years' time, you can build it tomorrow. It's very simple. So do you know what's really interesting? I just want to go back to Cyclone Bowler. Uh, there is a brilliant photo of one of my dad's trucks parked right on the other side of the Wairoa River. Where I was. Where the br yeah, there you go. Laurie was there was when the there. bridge had come down. Yep. Because the bridge was not built for what was needed. But they learned. They rebuilt the bridge, and guess what? It didn't get washed out, this, mm. this cyclone. And so we need to do things better than we have done before. And that goes back to my point, that we cannot just say, here's enough funding just to scrape you by. We need to build in resilience. We need to build in resilience funding. Which is That's why we've really built important. a resilience fund, which National's taking well, money from. I'm just really, funds. really pleased that everybody here, possibly except for Martin, who doesn't really believe that climate change is a I real threat. I believe in climate change, but not climate crisis and climate well, hysteria. So there we go. Actually, we're going everybody with that. agrees that we need more money for resilience. Yes. Well, so there was a provincial Mark, growth fund. Mark, we built the you Terrell believe Stop in climate Bank. change. Um, what I'm a needs, scientist first and foremost. What Martin. needs to be done? Um, because brilliant. if you believe in climate change, you going to, you believe that this is going to happen more. We're going to have more of these weather. Events. Well, it has been, hasn't it? Yeah. So if you look at the weather events from Nelson to Northland to Coromandel to Auckland, to here, I mean, the, the, the speed of these weather events is, is picking up. Um, we do need to be doing two things. We need to be, um, we, we have to play our part in trying to mitigate climate change getting worse, and we have to play our part in, um, in adaptation. And, 
you know, it's not the time to be robbing from, you know, the, the, the climate fund. It's not the time to be ran, robbing from it's the It's about delivering better outcomes, no matter where the funding cuts. comes from. There is huge investment required, and, and we need to be positive about it. So leaning into, I mean, the rest of the world's decided, right? So Europe's phasing out petrol and diesel cars from 2030. Mm, they've extended that. I think no, the UK, the, the, oh, well, so the, there you go, the UK is an outlier sorry. now that but, it's not in the European And so you'll follow them later. So the point is that we can either profit from it by being, being world leaders. We have natural advantages in renewable energy. The solar um, investment that Labour has announced will be great for Hawke's Bay, because I think Hawke's Bay has a lot to benefit from solar. Um, and things like Agritech that we are world leaders in. If we can you actually... You continue to punish farmers though, we, that's not... We can actually profit... We, well, we can't, we can't ignore international trade rules. If our farmers want to trade, um, and it's unfortunate that our methane is, is a large part of our... Um, is, of our zero 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 one percent. But the point is we have to meet percent. international obligations Except if we want China, to keep right? trading. Except China. Okay, we, we need move to on help to Martin. I believe... So that, right, you don't right, don't I know, I believe climate change. Huh? I believe it's climate change. I but do believe that we may have an influence, but I do not believe it is a climate crisis, and I do not believe exactly. in climate hysteria. We say so again, half evidence of the S Valley being right, washed down down yes. is not a climate and, crisis. And it, it's, a, it's a natural disaster, and it's a crisis, but it's not from the climate particularly. They actually opened up the, the old houses, and there was one which had from the 37 flooded. It just, you'd got the level of the mud inside the house from the 37. If you go no to one see, my, never been may, floods. Yes, and they're massive ones. And you, when, when Michael Fowler it's does his history, ago. history back in the late, 18, uh, late 1800s, there was floods, which, and the newspapers say, unprecedented flooding hits Hawke's Bay. Four years later, unprecedented flooding hits Hawke's Bay again. This is all before the 1900s. Then through the 1900s, there's more flooding. It's been happening. A cyclone bowler was missed off Niwa's reports on, on flooding events. And if you go back several months, there was a, <coughs> oh, last year, wasn't it? It was two years ago, the, the Tongan eruption. You're looking at world events around the place. So Tonga, we felt the, the blows of the, the um, I thought it was fireworks, and I thought this is crazy, this is the afternoon. We heard the pops of that. My daughter, who lives in Maranui, felt the wall of her house it was, um, actually flex. And we found out that was that afternoon, that was the eruption. So that's how strong it was. And millions and billions of, of, of gallons of water erupted. So it goes somewhere. We're in a closed system. As a scientist, you'd know we're in a, in a closed system. So water goes up. At some point, it's going to come down. So is it not that other events like that lead to climatic effects? You know, if we're saying that 15% gases are from cows is causing this problem, 15% of methane, 15% is from cows. If we've got billions of gallons of water going up into the atmosphere, at some point, that's going to come down. And over the last few months, is that, that's what we've seen, or early in the year, what's we've seen. Now, I'm not a climate specialist, I'm not an expert in it, but you've got to start thinking. Clearly. There's, well, clearly, right, yeah, we'll get on to health later as well and the, the vaccine. But start looking at what, let's do the proper research, get the real experts and people who are saying, well, this could be well, the I case. Well, I think peop many people would say the research has been done. Julian, what do you say about what Martin has just said? <laughs> I don't know how much he understands the science. You know, in the last 50 years, CO2 in the environment, in the atmosphere, the lower atmosphere, which is what determines our weather, has gone up exponentially. And the, the, the thing about that, that, those greenhouse gases is that they stop heat from dissipating yep. and they cause more heat. They cause more heat on the surface of the earth, which causes fires, wildfires, um, droughts, and it causes more heat on the ocean. The ocean is 70% of the Earth's surface, and it's the oceans which regulate our climate. And by having the air above the um, oceans being warmed, and the oceans themselves being warmed, it not only, it not only creates acidification in the, in the marine environment, which has a huge impact on the ecosystem, it also causes turbulent weather patterns. Yeah. And we see that more and more and more. The weather patterns are changing. And OK, of course, there's always been natural disasters. No one's denying that. But the scale of them, the regularity of them, the unpredictability of them is, is, is massively increasing. Okay, Can you we're going to have to move on. Oh, we're going to have to move on. So, Laurie, what's your view on, on climate change? Well, obviously, think, things are changing. We need to look at um, getting things settled down. But it's not to this um, crazy mayhem that has been preached and forced down our throats from climate, well obviously I'm not a climate expert, but these people are just doom and gloom. This, um, what did I say, I had, a, I had a something I'd read out in the uh, Pukitapu uh, taxpayers event about 
in the 1970s, acid rain would kill the world. In the 19, in 10 years, in 1980, the, all, all the icebergs would be melted. In 1990, Greta Thorberg said the and world... 30% uh, of them have the, moved the up Earl, since the, then. The, the, Earl, the, um, the earth would end last year. Okay, things are happening. So but let's take a pragmatic if, if approach of it. Coming through your yeah, house. but the thing is, it depends where cyclones hit. Cyclones hit in different parts of the area. So if, if you have the, um, the, the, the main weather bomb over a certain area, of course that's where the rain's going to be. This was and bigger there's, than and normal, there's, been though, higher, there's been higher floods in New Zealand, in Napier in the 30s, in the 20s and th it wasn't to this 1910s. Big the thing is, we need to take a pragmatic approach, slow down, everybody sit down and say, right, what's going to happen? New Zealand's 0.0001% of something. You've got India and China. Get these guys, you know, do something properly in the world to stop climate change. Don't kill us. Don't kill our farming. Don't get rid of New Zealand as, as a country because, ooh, the world's going to end with to global warming. New Zealand as a country. Just, have, just slow down, Katie, put your feet up, have a think. Are the current policies killing farming? Yes, they are. No, that's, that's that simple. I think the most important thing to acknowledge is that we have got to do something. And we've got to keep doing it. Exactly. We can't just say, hey, actually, you know, here's this policy and we're going to do this and that's it. It doesn't work. But we've got to be practical about it. And exactly. we've got to take people with us. And that is not what is being done at the moment. Mm -hmm. It's really important that we give farmers the tools to reduce their emissions rather than just squashing them down and down and down. Because everybody agrees we haven't. that not clean, even in green it. New oh Zealand is They're our not even in it. Everybody it's agrees. Rubbish. But he Waka Iki Noah was, is going was to cripple farmers. Kill farmers. We have to give them the tools. And we talk about agri Agritech. Agritech should be in partnership with agriculture. Absolutely. And it isn't. But Mark says there was consultation. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, yeah, all, the, the, all the industry you know bodies what? The were involved. The amount of farmers I talk to who say it is unworkable, it is impossible for them. It's crazy. They either have to They're sell fast part of their farms, they either have to put then most of it into pine or they have to reduce their herd. That is not going to help our economy. And they might need to economy. improve the representation so on their got, industry look, bodies that help to negotiate it with the government. We are going to double renewable energy. Now, this is the point. Biofuels. We need to double renewable energy infrastructure so that we can double renewable energy rather than being reliant on non-renewable sources. And so all that's happened, and I will go back to this again, by Labour banning coal mining in the South Island has meant that we Crazy. are still reliant on it and we are bringing it in from so, somewhere yeah. else. We are, burning less we, coal than, we are burning less coal now. I've looked this up since you said this. Katie keeps repeating this. We are burning less coal now than for the last 23 years. The one bad year that you're talking about, there was a drought and the, and the hydro lakes were low. Yeah. So we investigated hydro storage battery lakes and we're just investigating that as an option, right, so that we've got some backup storage in dry years to solve the dry year event, which may become more frequent, and we may get one this year. Here we go again. Did we import two million tonnes of coal last year from Indonesia? Here we go again. Did we import two million we are, Two million we are tons of dirty this, coal from Indonesia we are using last year coal now to make sure to make electricity. Look, electricity. Do you know what? I'm going to come yes. back to, to my point. Electric Regardless vehicles. of what everybody else says, we need to take action. And I exactly. strongly believe that what National is putting out there is practical environmental Pragmatic policy okay. that yeah. is going yeah. to take what? Getting, rid of the, getting rid of the clean the car discount. The bottom line is that how over helpful? last six years, gross emissions under this government, gross emissions have increased. No, it doesn't. So clearly, yes, it does. So clearly, look it up. So clearly. Clearly, your policy is not working. What I think we need to recognize is yes, climate change in is Havel? real and we need to do something. Policies. And we need to your do our bit. Uh, but our, our carbon and emissions are 8% down. We need to recognize that okay. it's a global issue. Our carbon we emissions need to, are falling. We, so what policies no, no, are no, What about our economy? Gross emissions are going up. Killing what I'm economy. saying... Our economy is, at 8% of uh, GDP ahead of pre-COVID is actually no, no, doing pretty well on the What we need to... No, no, no. The point is... International rating global agencies would disagree global with you issue, and your leader, okay? So it's very easy to come up with a policy... You're an engineer, not an economist. Makes, uh, yes, I am an engineer. That's why I understand it. And so you, what you, your policies sound nice in a stand-up, but they don't really deliver a reduction in emissions. What we need to do emissions is we need to reduce down, our emission targets journalists. in line with our, our trading partners. Because if we reduce them ahead of our trading partners, all that does is it moves the economic activity offshore. When it comes to farming, Farmers are not it even results in both yet. in increased emissions and in making New Zealand poorer. New Zealand farmers are most efficient when it comes to emissions. We're talking about in the world. Them in the world. So the last thing with, you want right? to do is all. to move the same production from New Zealand overseas. Nas somewhere. National's not proposing this is a better solution, though. They're proposing that we need to, to put the same our emission yeah. targets. We need to tie our emission targets to the targets of our trading partners. And if our trading partners wants to go down all the way to zero, we're going to go down all the way to zero. Well, that's We're the just game going we are to stay. This is the way 
that okay. we, uh, no. we're going to reduce oh, so the we need to not reduce sacrifice our the economy. Cost and okay. that is what our policies are going to do. We need to move on. We've got we clearly not don't too agree on time. climate. Sorry? We clearly don't agree on climate. Yes, mm -hmm. a few views. Don't yeah. believe the hysteria. Yeah. So, exactly, we're that's moving the on word. to another topic, and you must all behave yourself Shut on this you one. Oh dear. Uh, crime. Okay, oh. now, Mark, Labour government. Not me again. Well, you're the you're first. You're number one. So yeah, we you can, can, move, we can move, move on. Yeah, no, that's fine. I know, I'm happy. Um, a lot of criticism about the fact that, yeah. um, you know, with, with less people going to jail, people say there are more uh, criminals out there, and mm -hmm. that Labour is not doing enough to stop crime. What do you say to that? So there's a whole bunch of things tied up in that question. I'll start with the first thing. Is that what we will do is we will follow evidence-based approaches. So when I was a clinical psychologist in the 90s in the hut, uh, youth crime was actually worse than it is now, and boot camps were discredited because 82% of kids that went on nationals boot camps reoffended within six months. So we're investing in programs where 80% of the kids that go it's on them don't reoffend. 30% reduction in prison. Has there been a 30% drop in crime? Not, no. not related. Why so the when you look at, of course it's related. Hang, no, 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 no. Yeah, but How that's the evidence. Evidence. Correlation's not the same as causation. Because the kinds of people that have been got out of uh, jail are not the kinds of people that are committing the crimes. The crime, the, where the crime has risen has been, yes, around the world post-COVID there's been a bit of a youth uh, wave of crime. There's been an increased Get reporting... Off. There's been a significant increase in reporting of domestic violence within the home, which is really sad and distressing, but at least it's being recorded now. Um, so the sorts of things that it's very easy to talk tough on crime when you are not in government, but when you're in government, it's what you do that matters. So when, when National was in government, the numbers of police fell as a proportion of the population. The task, we, have, we have raised the police by 1,800. We have no. given the police Provincial powers to fight. take assets from us. gangs. We have taken, just two weeks ago, we took $2.1 million off the local mongrel mob. We've laid 50,000 charges against um, gang members over the last year. So it is not true that we're not going going hard against gangs and against criminals. Well, clearly it's not working. Why no. is the crime increasing? And Mark Mitchell would have said that, that what you've done is it's, it's roading tickets, isn't it? And it's license tickets. And it's not so much... Cri uh, that's what he said at the meeting when um, Stuart Nash was there. And Stuart said exactly the same as you. And Mark Mitchell stood up and said, would you admit that it is parking tickets, infringements, parking infringements? That's where you get in... The, that's I wouldn't where think you that taking $2.1 million off the local mongrel But you gave it back to them in, in Wire or Waipuk. You gave it back, didn't Waipuk. you? You gave it for a gardening, this, look, so, this is exactly for a gardening the point. scheme. We need real action actual change and consequences because we are cultivating a culture where brazen criminal activity is acceptable. People who commit crimes are still being put in jail at just the same rate. The, the reduction in the, the, so a big part of the reduction in the, the muster in the prisons was people that were stuck in jail because they didn't have things like transitional housing to go to at the end of their paroles. And so what they did is they went through and they worked out what's the way to get this person rehabilitated into a job or into transitional housing. But is that rehabilitation you can't keep a person in jail, Mark, if they're more than they want. It won't be perfect. We won't be fully there yet, Andrew, but we're investing a lot more in rehabilitation. Because statistics do show that people who go to jail and they get out, they do reoffend. Unless so they get into a job. The, if you're reducing the population by 30%, that means you're putting, potentially putting people out there who and are. And reducing going to their sentences too, yeah. I might add. Yeah. We are seeing people well, with lower sentences, sentences than they should have who Respect. end up on home detention who should not be there. Well, well, my predecessor will tell you what happens if you challenge a judge on the sentencing. Uh, well, <laughs> just, you will set yeah. the laws right in the first place. Stuart Nash actually came up at the, on, um, at the Estelle meeting all those months ago and he said, Oh, well, do you really? want 14 and 15 year olds ending up in prison I think of his comment and the whole room said well if they're doing the crime and they're coming through and they're lifting stuff from the from the flood affected yes we do they wanted consequences okay not putting juveniles into a into a jail but, but having consequences for their actions and that's what labor and Stuart Nash oh, threw his hands up in the air so you want there are absolutely are consequences there should actions. be consequences or be better and, 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 and so to take to take one doesn't deter them to take one offense as an example that's gone through the roof in recent times it was ram raiding 80 percent of the kids that get caught consequenced and put into some kind of program don't reoffend. But if you take somewhere like Auckland, there are 13 known kids and families where they, the, the, recidiv the recidivist offending keeps happening. It was exactly the same when I was a psychologist in the 90s. Every neighbourhood or every city will have a handful of families which will be very difficult whether you're Bill English with your social investment program or, or whether you're Labour. This, the, crime is a complex intergenerational Can um, I issue. Can I say something and about you don't, crime? You we'll don't, thank you. you don't solve it by dog whistling. Yeah. You solve it by increasing the numbers of police, giving them the powers that they tell you that 
that they need. Sounds like by, national by policy. By laying charges. Well, that's what policy. we're doing, though. That's the point. Well, it's easy to talk about on crime. It's hard to make it go now, away. Now, Julian, do you even believe that prisons <coughs> work? I think that's a very complex question. Mm -hmm. Clearly, it doesn't work for some people, and clearly it does work for some other people. It doesn't work for young people. Prisons notoriously can harden criminals and make them more, um, more hardened and more learn more in, in terms of what to do next. One of the things that I note um, is that when there's an election, crime gets pulled out of the hat because all you need to do is say, we're tough on crime, and then everybody thinks, oh, well, they're a really good party. It's much more complex than that. I mean, I, I do agree partly with Mark that you need to be really looking at the drivers of crime exactly. and addressing those, right. you know. And it's no surprise that crime's gone up when the cost of living's gone up, for example. But it's also the focus on things like gangs, and I agree, things need to be done about gangs. Of course they do, of course they commit harm. And completely ignoring the kind of white collar crime, and the tax um, evasion, and all of those things. You know, we don't talk about those because they're nice white middle class crimes, and we don't. You know, they're not what we're talking about. We're talking about poor people committing crimes. Is what we. we so we need to be looking at the drivers of crime. We need to be looking at rehabilitation. We need to be looking at better integration, reintegration back into the community. All of those programs, and of course, there need to be consequences yeah. for crime. The, the gangs you know, are I've, poor. I've been I've a victim victim of crime and of course I wanted there to be consequences for the people who perpetrated that but it's not the only answer. Yeah. Now Laurie you've actually worked in a prison as a prison Correct. corrections warden, officer yes. Corrections officer. Yes. Do they work? Do prisons work? They do. Yeah. I've had um, so much interaction with, in, with guys in prison. The thing is it, is it is a complex system a lot of the guys I had worked with it's obviously intergenerational you've had three three you've had the grandfather the son and the grandson, all mongrel mob members, all in prison at the same time. So you really got to go back and look at what's starting the crime life in the first place. They had so many initiatives in prison. Um, they had Hawkeye Rangi, which was only for Maori inmates, and that was to take them through a pathway of getting back onto their, their pathway of life. And the return rate of those who had graduated was about 90%. So 90% came back to prison. So obviously there's a few things you need to address in the prison system. The punishment is not hard enough. Um, we've just released our law and order policy. So if, if it's serious crime, murder, it's life for a life. You've really got to crack down on these criminals because I've seen guys in there that have murdered children, they've murdered their wives, and they're just quite happy to go outside and re-offend again. Yeah. And these gang-only prisons at Winston? Yes, 100%. Because working in the prison system, you see these young guys come in, and straight away on that first day, they're already approached by a black power or mongrel mob. Yeah. And if they don't join, they will get assaulted, they get beaten up, and it's, it's a horrible It's a horrible. Winston Peters couldn't say how he's going to pay for that, but we'll... We'll, we'll, we'll talk on. about the finances. There's been money wasted, we know. But the thing is, if you have a... a to make them a terrorist organisation, you really... And it's worked in Western Australia and Queensland. You really need to crack down on what these guys... Because you look at it now. They've got the police guarding them. All that they closed down... Oh, Fakatani or something to for all these gangs to go to to go to a funeral. Really, yeah. the people had to stay inside while the gangs had the free run. And the thing is, um, a prison only for gang members is a way of isolating them, so you're not actually going into the process of recruiting more and more members. So but mate, is this is a complex system. Is it is a complex to system. Lock, lock everyone up. Pardon? Is the solution to lock everyone up? No, do you know up? what? The solution is to give people an absolute path of good alternative and to show them that the wrong path leads to consequences. Will you keep because apprenticeship boost then? Excuse me? Will you keep apprenticeship boost then to help people that are Yeah, absolutely. Look, we're going to back... Do you know what? National came up with the Trades that. Academy. National yeah. came up with the Trades Academy and that is not the point. The point is, I am talking to people who is absolutely gut-wrenching. They are the victim and they no longer feel like the victim. Mm. There are people who are committing serious crimes that end up with a $400 fine. Mm. We have a policy that means you cannot reduce a, a sentence or discount it by more than 40%. Yeah. Because there is nothing worse than the victim of crime seeing their perpetrator back out on the street re-offending. And there is also nothing worse than the cops who are doing their absolute best job seeing those people re-offending again and again and again. We need to give them a strong path of an alternative, great education, high value jobs, to show them that there is another path 
to crime and we need to show that there are strong consequences for that because at the moment the criminal is being treated like the victim, they are not getting strong consequences and we need to turn that around because it is brazen, it is not fair on our community and we've got to make a difference. Do you agree with that Pavel that do you think victims have less rights than actual perpetrators? Yes, I've actually observed that it's interesting that the discussion on the left is so concentrated on the criminals and there isn't a single agree. word about the victims. So if you're asking uh, who does it help to put the murderer in the prison rather than on an ankle bracelet, surely it helps the victim. Well, doesn't no, take a psychologist to understand that murderers that. should have ankle bracelets. What the rehabilitation? Yes, we have. We have. We, we have serious at the moment. Criminals need we have to be serious brutal criminals on ankle bracelets right now, and this is a large part of the problem. Okay. Of course, when you go to the prison, there needs to be rehabilitation. We don't want those people to reoffend, but in a way, for some so of those criminals, the, money for the best with your place cats. to get rehabilitated is the prison. Do you know what? We're going to cut cultural reports. Acts we're yes. going to take money from the paid cultural reports and give it back to the victims. That is a so good thing to do. Well, the first thing is, let's, let's go to the basics. Issue, though, the thing right? is, everybody who leaves the prison it, needs to be it. able to read and write and drive a car. Mm. Driving we licenses. Did that, driving license, reading and writing, because this is what allows you to join the society, yeah. not the crime society. You yeah. can't get a job, you can't fill in a job application, you can't do anything if you can't I've do seen, it. I've seen young guys come in there, mate, they can't even read and write, so I don't know how the education system is looking after yeah. them. And when you, when you go through their, um, their report, when they come into prison, you can see like you know, their charges and, and where they've come from. And I would say at least 80 or 90% of their first charge was no driving license. So, the ACTS so you start to think to on how the so that's what the how and thing. Then that's the right? thing, is, yeah. was, is to get their driving licence. So the how and leads to do right. good work in this area, yeah. which has been it's quite okay. a weird we're, thing. We're going to move on now because we're running out of time. Just on to another big issue, which let's keep it brief if we can. Um, uh, health. Oh. And now there's been a lot <laughs> made about, um, well, there are two issues, local issues here. The one is the building of a new hospital, um, which... Um, the Prime Minister announced the other day that they're going to build a new hospital. National will say that actually, well, they wanted to do it last election. And, and the other issue, which I know is a hot topic for you, Mark, is a 24-hour medical um, facility in Napier, yep. which doesn't have it at staff, the moment. Mate. So we'll start with you on those two issues. Right, so well, I'm, I'm, I'm pleased to be able to, um, you know, on the side of the argument that we, we're going to be building a, a, you know, rebuild of the Hawke's Bay Hospital. Where's the money um, coming where's from? Where's the money for that? Well, it's in the budget. We've budgeted for, <coughs> we've budgeted um, between 700 million and 1.1 billion for it, and it's in, it's in the it's The in Prime the Minister said it's coming from the infrastructure fund that they have for so, hospitals and schools. Right. So, so, oh. so, 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 to be clear about oh, investment right. in health, we've spent six times as much in six years as in the entire nine years of the key government on the on the fabric of our hospital system, we inherited a hospital system. We inherited a hospital system where 20 separate health boards boards had been systematically underfunded, were carrying debts and deficits, and there was literally poo in the walls in some of the hospitals in Auckland because when you set a small number of targets and focus on those, and you don't look at the the entire infrastructure of your health service, it decays. And so I think, you know, all Kiwis will know, um, if they really think about it and look into their hearts, they'll know that under national, health and education always slide backwards. Teachers and doctors and nurses, their relative pay in society slips under national governments. Oh, look, let's look and the into the future, Mark. We are still building Dunedin Hospital, which should have been built in the key years, right? We are always behind on health when we get in after national. And we, so, so the positive thing is, if Labor's re-elected, we will continue to increase the investment in health infrastructure. Will you and I will be arguing no as a local outcomes? MP for a slice of that, for us to have 24-7 services. Go back, and Katie, and go we, we have, the difference between this time and when National promised it is when we got into government, they hadn't funded the hospital, just like the last two times they, they promised a four-lane highway to, for between um, Napier and Hastings, they didn't fund it then either. When we promised it, we weren't actually in government. Yeah. You so still Martin, have to cost your policies. We did. What you didn't. Do you believe the new hospital should be built? And what do you think about what Mark says about the 24-hour? Uh, yeah, I agree with the 24-hour um, service, the, the better service for Napier, because we, Gabrielle showed that we were isolated. We need, we need something there that people actually get proper treatment in. And if we're isolated from Hastings, and the only option there is going to be by helicopter, we need to be able to provide emergency services. Uh, flooding is going to be, we've got earthquakes, but there are other natural disasters that will cause problems for Napier. Mm -hmm. Uh, the hospital, brilliant. If we're going to get a new hospital or new hospital services, and I'd still like some of that sidelined for, for, more for Napier. I'd like to see it spread across the, our, our district. 
The other thing we need is hands on, on deck. We need we, all those people who were cut from the, the health service due to the mandates, the vaccine mandates. I'll go back to that and say they should be reinstated, apologised to, and back into the hospitals. We need paid, paid hands, for hands on deck. Um, and they ought to be apologised to for, for, for being pushed out of, from the workforce. Yeah. So, Gillian, how do we get that workforce? How do we get those skills to be able to populate our hospitals and provide these services? Okay. Well, obviously, I also agree about the 24-7 Napier yeah. Health Service, and, and I'm really pleased about the rebuild of the hospital. Um, in terms of how to get the... Well, you need to be increasing pay and conditions for, for wealth, for for medical staff so that they don't go to Australia. So that they're much keener on staying in New Zealand to mm. do the job. You need to be obviously recruiting more people from overseas as a short term measure and you need to be training more of them. So you need to be investing more in the training budget for um, medical services. And just a couple of other things I'd like to say as well. Very is, quickly, please. Yes, is about investing in health promotion and disease prevention initiatives, which is a real Cinderella of the New Zealand um, health service. We need to be investing more in that so we're actually not having to pay so much for acute care. I'll leave it at that. Yeah. Laurie, health yeah, service. Yeah, health is pretty, pretty much a nightmare in Napier when the cyclone hit. Um, and again, it needs to have something in Hawke's Bay. Obviously, a building's fine, a nice building, but it's the staffing. We have just got... Like two or three thousand nurses have but left. New Zealand First doesn't want anyone to come into the country. You don't want <laughs> No, it, the, the statement is bring in who we want, not who wants us. We need to put a list of what the people need because exactly how, how many thousands of nurses have left? And they've been arguing, they've been struggling over so trying to get up extra pay. And yet, and yet they'll, build a 90, they'll spend 90 billion on a light rail. Why don't we just use some of that money and use it wisely? Start to think, instead of putting a, a 90 billion dollar light rail, there hasn't been a, an inch of track laid, why don't we start looking at our people who Which really the need to run this spent. country? We need nurses, we need doctors. They've got wards in, in Auckland Hospital that <clears throat> they can't operate in. They've got doctors, they've got nurses, they don't have an anaesthetist, so they can't do the operation. We so need the resources in the country. So Katie, um, Labor's stealing your idea for, for yeah. hospital, you reckon? Yeah, well look, you know, we don't argue about needing a new hospital, but mm. I think the priority, Just like our other candidates have said, <laughs> like our other candidates have said, that we need the numbers of staff. And mm. the same goes for a 24-7 medical centre in Napier. I'm a strong advocate for that. That would be amazing. Mm. But our spokesperson for health, Shane Retty, Dr Shane Retty, who had been an incredible health minister, he did an overnight shift at Napier Medical Centre, mm. and he said, Katie, it was appalling. When was the there last time? There is not one person there that could prescribe medication. So the person that comes in overnight that needs support, they have to pay to go back to a doctor the next day to get their prescription. It is outrageous. Katie, so we when was need the last time the National numbers. built a hospital in government and just that, didn't talk about it in opposition? It's about health outcomes. Healthcare. It is about our health outcomes. You could have the shiniest hospital mm. out there and we don't disagree with that but you need the people inside it You first. need to invest you in the health system. You cannot operate and we are. You year need to invest year, in the health system over successive health governments. Year on year. We need to make sure we are achieving outcomes. The last Currently time, the this last government time national has not had one had the health, health outcome for everything that they have done and if you talk to staff in the current health system they are crippled. They cannot do their job. What's your solution to the health uh, Well, obviously it's a good idea to have a new hospital in Hastings, but the problem is that it's highly suspicious that Labour finally saw the light three weeks before <laughs> the election and announced <laughs> this, the, the, the hospital. We remember well, Light Rail, had a look at Dunedin Hospital, which is being downscaled all the time, that was last election's promise. You have a long track record of promising what people want to get well, some votes built Dunedin hospital. and not deliver. It's supposed to be built a lot meanwhile, earlier. Meanwhile, in Hastings, there is a private hospital, so, so the private, health. private workforce has got so frustrated with the way things have been over the last six years, yeah. that they walked across the road and actually built the hospital for themselves. And already there is publicly funded procedures being happening in this hospital. Which is a good okay? thing. So what ACT is saying, like with the roading infrastructure, the way to accelerate delivery of such infrastructure is to involve private capital. No, it's to it's do working both. in the UK, it's working in other it's countries, and this is the only sustainable way to actually have a hospital as opposed to just promise a hospital three weeks okay. before the election. Mm. We're going to have to move on, we're running out of time, so quick answers to this. Um, four lane highway or passenger rail service between Napier and Hastings or both? 
We don't have the population to oh. economically support the rail service, but what I would want is I would want to see the, um, planning for more and faster bus services with the four lane. Uh, oh, that planning option. has been done. Yeah. Lucky that. Martin, what do you say? Uh, yeah, uh, look, if we can get the four lanes, that would be brilliant. The other thing is maybe look at our light railway and turn it to light railway, where you take smaller vehicles and put the wheels on that you see that the service vehicles do. Yeah. Get away from the trains, make it cheaper. Maybe it's about an option. So you want look, a whole lot of cars on Not on cars, the, but, the but trucks. But I mean, we've only got a one way. It's a one line, isn't it? So it's, yeah. it's, 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 it's tricky. It's very is. tricky. Yeah. Julian, you'd be keen on the passenger rail service, wouldn't you? Yes, although I, I understand it's not going to solve the problem. And I also understand why people want a four-lane highway. And I, but I use that a lot, actually, because I travel a lot between one and the other. And actually, I don't see that there's a major problem. I hardly ever, I mean, admittedly, I don't go at rush hour, but there isn't, to me, a major problem. However, it may be that that's the best answer. I, I actually find that difficult to say because as somebody who campaigns for less car use and less um, funding on the infrastructure, obviously there are exceptions yeah. to that. Yep. But you do support electric cars, though, don't I think, you, unlike yes. our opposition? Yeah, I think it's a mix. Of, um, I'd, I'd love to see the, the passenger trains back to between, Naples, obviously between um, wow. Gisborne and Wellington to get all this, this stuff moving and get a lot of the, the roading. Um, if you have um, a mixed rail service, then you'd get a lot of the trucks off the road. So you'd have to look at the balances, getting the rail working, mixed, um, uh, mixed train, so you've got a lot of freight on the train system, so there's less trucks on the road whether you need to build another two lanes if there's less trucks on the road. So again, it's just about looking and having a proper analysis of the whole project. Katie, very quickly. Yeah, so look, obviously we are massive advocates for the four-lane expressway, so we are committed to doing that. We're going to do that when we get into government. And so I think it's really important to... If you get to, into government. Well, yeah. hey, got to be confident. But the point is, light rail, or rail in general, um, at the moment our current rail line does not go where most of the population are. Uh, and so it would require a huge amount of expense. Um, and from a freight point of view, it, it's not economic anything less than 300 kilometres. Yeah. You know, so I think it's really important to say, where can we spend the best money to get the value? And, and you look at the, the road at the moment, uh, the reason that people take those alternative routes, whether it was Brookfields before the bridge came <coughs> down, or Wailhiki, they did that to avoid the expressway because it was not express. Yeah. We need to make our region more connected and move our product and our people through okay. faster. Pavel, quickly. Well, we believe that the role of the government, also local governments, the deliver what the people want. And clearly people want more roads at the moment. So yes, double lane expressway, 100%. In the long term, it should be the market that decides what mode of transport is preferred by the people. Yeah. At the moment, it's the other way around. Rather than having government picking winners and saying, oh, it should be passenger rail, yeah. through, for example, emissions trading schemes and other tools, we can manipulate the prices. So at some point, <laughs> people will choose the train because it's the best option. And this is the way around that it should be, yeah. not the other way around. Now, we could have a whole debate on co-governments, but unfortunately, we're running out of time. So what's your stance in one sentence, Mark, on co-governance? In one sentence? one sentence? So can we take an element of it, like water reform? Or well, who owns the water, we could ask now. you, and what, so, what so, is... So we all own the water, and the treaty's really clear about that, that we, we both, both parties to the treaty have an in interest treaty. in the water. Um, the really, uh, to, to use that as an example, so co-governance was um, evolved, um, you know, Chris Finlayson and the National Party evolved that approach to dealing with the Waikato River system, which I'm familiar with how that works because I work quite closely with Mercury Energy. Um, it's a very effective um, structure, the way, what they use here, but in terms of water for the country, it's been under in for decades, so there's a requirement, if we're going to get this sorted out without putting massive bills on ratepayers, to have a separate balance sheet yeah. entity. So what the, the partnership body that sits across the top of the water structure does, and all that does is choose the directors that sit on the water entities, right? By making it 50% iwi and 50% council, it enables it to be far enough away from the council to create a separate balance sheet and it also prevents National or ACT ever in the future selling our water because yeah. so are the Māori, Māori, are the Māori voters not sell, are the the Māori the Māori will never sell water fund because they see it as something that is the sacred for iwi. all of us. Yeah. What about co-governance of your other services though? That's right. So which services do we want to tackle next? Because it's all it's, it's complex and everyone's a little well, different. We it's don't racist. have time for this, so we'll Let's move go. on. I Martin, I think I, I, against yes, it is, is our basic at the moment because I don't think it's been fully explained, fully understood, and fully thought through how it's actually going to work with unelected members being put on committees. Julian, what do you say about this? 
I have absolutely no problem with, with Māori being given a voice in, in matters that um, affect them. For too long they've been excluded from decision making. They have they're not. continually, they're, they're still um, largely, uh, ex largely excluded from decision making. And for things that, for which the, it's, it's about true. having That's not a true. voice. They've always been involved. It's about a partnership. It's the device of a resource. It's about safe for all of us. And we fully support the, the partnership with and so our treaty obligations. The treaty obligations. is not a partnership. The treaty so was not. A, no, no. It's not a partnership. It's all about well, New Zealand. It wasn't. View. It wasn't divided. The treaty never, never said it's, it's, it's a partnership. Maori ceded sovereignty. So this whole thing about co-governance is oh, go right back reason, to the beginning reason. where one Maori people, where one vote, and the thing was, it's all about, and no, share the land. they gave, That's you're, the, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're, you're telling, no, it Maori well, ceded sovereignty. To, the thing yeah. is co-governance is, is corrupt and it's, it's a separatist thing, so that will be gone. New Zealand First will totally get rid of that. Well, well, that's the kind of scaremongering so and it's simple for us. So climate change, and climate change scaremongering too. It's simple for us. For us, it is no co-governance of public services. We want outcomes-focused services that get the best outcome for everybody, and that is really important. But, as Mark mentioned, history. Chris Finlayson, yes, he was supportive of co-governance of natural resources in treaty settlements. Yeah. There is a place for it, but it is not in public services. We need to have the best outcome for everybody. Pavel, not on who you well, it's about accountability work. of public servants. Yeah. For example, with water, you need to make sure, and it's for the best of the water resources, that all the people on the board are elected, which is the only way they are accountable to the people who fund those resources. If you nominate half of the board, then you can't vote them out. So ACT firmly stands against co-governance. Mm. It should be one person, one vote. Amen. And everything should be on universal human rights. And actually, this is what it says. They're all equal. Well, thank you for that, everyone. That was great. We're just going to now go for a closing remark, and then we'll end the debate. We'll start with you, Pavel, um, with the closing remark. How long is this, Andrew? Um, if you can keep it to a minute. We have gone oh. over. So if you just keep it to a minute, that would be great. Well, I'll try to keep it short. In less than two weeks' time, New Zealand is facing a real choice, and we can choose more of the same, or we can choose real change. And vote for ACT is the only vote that will ensure that we have real change in New Zealand. And we've all voted for the parties that had multiple chances to turn things around for New Zealand, and it didn't eventuate. So I believe that the only real change uh, that will be included in this next government is ACT Party. The way it looks, we would take care about the economy, we would stop the crime epidemic that Labour has funded us, we would make sure that it's one person, one vote, like I've said. Yeah. And the only way to get New Zealand on track with a stable government at the moment is an ACT national coalition. And it is possible right now. The alternative, there's two alternatives. One is inaction and the other is instability. Okay, we're going to have to so call, call time on that. Okay. Thank you. Okay, well, that's your minute. Yeah. Right, Katie. well, look, the, the point is really clear. Uh, we have only one way to guarantee a change of government, and that is a party vote for national. But I'm here hoping to be Napier's electorate MP. I am hoping to be the representative of the people. And that is the job that I'm here for. I want to make that really clear. The second part is that a party vote for national will reduce the cost of living, it will grow our economy, it will build infrastructure for the future, not just for five years by five years. Mm. We will restore law and order and we will have world-class health and education. We will continue to e increase funding year on year. So I want to make sure that that message is really clear because the people I am talking to are struggling. And we cannot continue to talk about the past when people are worried about their future. And a party vote for national, with me as your representative, Katie Nimmin, is the only way to get New Zealand back on track. Thank you. Laurie, what's your Yeah, I think the main, the main thing is the, the, the four critical areas which New Zealand First will get focus on, which is education, health, housing and law and order. So those are the four big pillars that need to, that you need, they have to be looked at and addressed and, and, and just focus and just get everything working again that's now broken under this government. But in this election you have two votes. Please give New Zealand first your party vote. Vote any other way and you won't get any change. If you want New Zealand to what we once were, the greatest country on earth, 
then you know what you need to do. Party vote New Zealand first, and let's take back our country. Julian? Well, as somebody who grew up in the 50s, I take issue with you that we were the greatest country that ever was, because I could tell you loads of things that were wrong with New Zealand in the 1950s, and I'm really pleased to say that things have uh, enormously oh. improved since then. Um, if you want um, a government that is going to do something seriously about the climate, if you want a government that's actually seriously going to address inequalities and not just pretend that we're all equal because one size fits all for any public services simply has never worked and is not going to work. So you need specific initiatives to address inequalities. If you want a fair distribution of wealth, then you need to party vote green so that we can make uh, whichever government is, go further and faster. But I would urge you to think about um, a, a Labour-Green uh, coalition, because otherwise what you're going to get is this coalition of chaos here. Yeah. I love to see them working together. So you um, want us to be divided by who our ancestors were? The country's okay. divided by okay, who our ancestors were. Okay, Martin, your closing remark? Democracy New Zealand intends to bring back honesty and morality to government. We want to get in there and make a change for the better. We stand for our farmers, our food producers, for freedom, supporting the Bill of Rights which was trashed by the current regime. We stand for family, old-fashioned values, support decency and counter dubious education. Sovereignty, reduce the outside influences on New Zealand. We're a party of diverse talent, people from farming, healthcare, the police, engineering, education, finance and community development. Most of us small business owners, so we know what we're talking about and we believe in evidence of ideology. Um, so, I want the Greater Napier area to be a place where my children want to live and bring up their children. And it's not about left or right, or the way around. It's about going forwards as a country, led by those Kiwi values that bring us together. So please get out and vote. Vote for democracy as your party vote. Vote for Martin Langford and vote for positive change. Mark Hutchinson, last right. word to you. So, um, look, Labour has a really positive, forward-looking um, um, approach to, to, to the economy. By accepting the challenges of our time, which includes climate and it includes inequality, um, we think that we can build a fairer society, but one where we have a strong economy where everybody can benefit and, and, and reach, reach their best potential. Um, so I have um, articulated what I think that means in terms of my pledges for Napier. I don't have time to run through them, but those are available on the HB app. Um, I, it's a combination of having the right social services like health and housing, um, and actually a very a clear look at how we can make a more productive economy. So, you know, I believe that I am the right candidate for you to vote for for the MP for Napier because I've got um, a, a deep and broad experience across both the public and private sector. I've worked in health, I've worked in senior leadership in a range of businesses. You know, Katie's going to get in on the list. And so if you, want, if, you want, if you want two MPs for Napier fighting your case and you want me to be one of them, vote Mark Hutchinson for your candidate vote for Napier. Thank you so much. Thank Thanks. you, everyone. That was a good debate. You basically all behaved yourselves, so thank <laughs> you for that. Um, and thanks once again to Ur the Urban Winery. For this is where you shout us lunch now. <laughs> the Urban Winery for hosting us. It's been really good. And to Engage Video for producing and broadcasting this. Thank you, and we'll see you next time.